Um, so I think uh, that's it with all the talks. Um, what we did before the meeting was we sent a little questionnaire out and uh, just asking local residents if they've got any concerns uh, just to allow the panelists to have some time to prepare responses because often you find that you know the questions are presented on the day um, and you may not get the response you're looking for. Um, so I think the, the, the questions were shared uh, with John and Dan um, so I wouldn't put uh, Tony on the spot but obviously you can ask him questions. So if I just begin with um, the questions that we had. Um, so um, I think first ones around CCTVs. Now uh, this was a discussion uh, Be Safe had with uh, the council and uh, the, the case was that there have to be crimes in the area to put CCTVs. At the time, we had asked if I go to point three, the Dimpley Town Centre, where you've got Iceland and Co-op and all that, and we'd asked if the CCTV is put over there. Uh, unfortunately, a few weeks later, we had a break-in where on the first floor, there were about nine or 11 private offices that were smashed in and, and, and burgled. It was horrible. Uh, but that really got back the point that do we have to always wait for incidents to happen? But we often know that you know these areas are congregation points um, and then the groups disperse. So we have had weak spots. So if I just list them, in Hale Barns, the Boots area. Now, these are all public areas, so hopefully there shouldn't be issues of permission. We're not overlooking private houses. They're all shops around. Um, you can find some antisocial behaviour, you could probably, you know, intervene to prevent something from happening. Um, the roundabout of M56 exit 7, you do find uh, some police cars parked at the roundabout sometimes, uh, but we, uh, the council did say they'll look into whether a CCTV is already there. Um, we haven't heard that, but, you know, we've got John here, so... Um, I'm as far as I'm aware that there is no CCTV. The issue with the current system is that every time you move a camera, there is a cost, non cost, of between four, four hundred pounds and a thousand pounds to move an individual camera. Uh, and it's got a line of sight somewhere else to where it links up. They've only got so many cameras at the moment, which is why they're looking at a new system. And it tends to be there has to be a, a very good reason, a, a, a serious crime trend going on in an area or a threat to life because they've got to got a grade on them, where they're going to put these cameras and the cost of it, which is why they're looking at a new system which makes the cameras far cheaper to buy and far cheaper to install. But at the moment, it's really difficult to get the cameras moved. The last ones we got moved were in response to the uh, Rolex watch robberies in Hale, uh, and that took a number of months to get those moved, and each one cost between £400 and £1,000 to move those cameras. So there's a significant cost of Right, okay. Um, I think the, the concern really is that that's really the entry exit points for a lot of uh, gangs operating from around the areas uh, and also neighbouring cities. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned Timberley, and then the next, the last one was Borden. Uh, we've had, um, uh, and I live there, so I know that our co op has got broken into three times. Um, I think the last one was last year, uh, sometime last year, we did invite them to come over uh, with their stuff, you see, so uh, they have to get permissions. But uh, the thing is that we also had some um, suspicious people walking past. Um, so again, you know, it's whether we can look into these sort of weak spots in some of the areas that we have identified. That's not to say that we've covered all of traffic, but we say it was at a much smaller um, uh, remit um, before it was catapulted to, to you know the neighbourhood watch area for track birds. So these are just very restrictive uh, zones that we've covered. Um, so I think John's answer that: Do we know when we can see or whether these areas are in your list for consideration? Right. This is where I think this is where council needs to come in. At the moment, the the council is going through a project to to move to the new system got the existing ones, they know where they want to get to and they're putting in place a project manager to do that and they're in the, 
the moment they're looking at different CCTV systems around the country. For me, this is down to councils to push up with that project, because it's a council project, to have a say on where we want, cam on where we want these um, CCTV cameras. Uh, and that's really what the push is going to come from. From councillors, know the areas where they think they want to do more CCTV cameras and have that say at the early stage of that project, because it's too late. Once they've bought all the cameras and decided where they're going, it's too late. At this stage, we need to be in there saying, we need some intensity towns <coughs> to the ASB, we need some more down in Hale at these pinch points, because that's where uh, we think people are coming and going from the area. Um, so, the councillors, I would encourage you know, I can pass on details of the council who's running that project, and that's where the drive needs to come. <coughs> yeah, I would encourage people to do contact your councillors about this type of issue. It, it's, it's the kind of issue that we, we can go to the council with, find the officer who's in charge of the project, and we can make sure that we ask those questions. Why aren't you putting it in this area? But now's, now's a prime time. They're yeah. setting up that project. Let's get in there now and put pressure on to get more cams working. Yeah, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head, it's probably three or four areas in Altrin where I'd you know, probably consider putting them in you know, Navigation Road, for instance, where you've got the Metrolink at one end, and then you've got the A56 the other. There's a lot of passing traffic, a lot of teenagers going down the street, sometimes you know, after pub closing time, causing a bit of a nuisance. So you can see instantly you know, areas that could do with more CCTV, and obviously that's where the councillors can come in, feeding that information back to the relevant officers and trying to push for these things to happen. But um, a lot of it relies on you know, uh, residents getting in touch with councillors, um, pestering them, making sure that they you know, get on and do it. And, but also we can get back with answers why the council can't do something as well. And sometimes there are many limitations. But yeah, I would say do pest the council. <coughs> Just one thing, I apologise, I didn't mention about the council before, but um, when we started off two years ago, uh, we, we realised, you know, the police were very supportive because, I mean, we, we, we was a bit cheeky and said to your chief in Manchester, we're the cheapest form of government intelligence that you'll ever get. And he, and he was, you know, dead supportive. But to be fair, uh, we have now got a councillor attending uh, every one of our neighbourhood watch meetings. And uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, one of the, the uh, couples in, 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 the, uh, in the group said there was lights out on our street. So the councillor who was there got in touch with the highways the next day. So instead of say, phoning the police and saying, hey, my lights are out, actually there's a direct link if you go through your councillor who can phone highways and, and get that booked in to be repaired. Now, in our instance, I think it took five days uh, and we got a result now that, that was excellent so the benefits of working in partnership not only with the police and, and the PCS but also with your councillor and I use the word power and it is, can be very powerful because there is a statute where you have to get a response within is it so many days? Yeah, generally, generally I'm meant to get a response within three days I can see Dave laughing <laughs> but, I know, but you know if I, if I raise it as a coordinator to the council I'm just another you know citizen and it's dealt with but you know, you've got councillors by, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's use them. Um, but yeah, so I forgot that. So if you can get a councillor, every one of your meetings for, for domestic issues that can be dealt with, you could pick it up and say, get on with it. So, thank you. Yeah, I suppose um, one thing I would say was councils have had funding cuts from central government by 60% since 2010. So, also, we have to you know, tell people we have to be realistic and there's only so much councils can do with the budgets they've got. But um, yeah, by different partnerships getting together, though, you, you can be creative and you can find solutions and you can find ways sometimes of, of doing things more cheaply or finding funding from different areas. So I would always say come to a councillor if you can, and at least we can try. <laughs> Right, thank you. Uh, does anybody else? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, are you actually legally allowed to have a certain TV camera not only looks at your own property? <coughs> Excuse me. This also happens to be in the road. Yes, you can as a private citizen. Uh, there are some rules that um, you have to follow, certainly around recording 
uh, how, how you're storing information um, and making it available. If anyone really wants that, I have the electronic um, information on that. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll share on myself with Hill and that will be put out. So you can do, there's not an issue with it, as long as you follow some very simple rules. Um, it gets a bit more tricky if your CCTV um, covers somebody else's property. But again, if you can, you can justify, you can do, um, but it's within these rules. But we'll make sure that information is available to you.
protect them um, before they've even got to your house. It isn't prohibitive. If you look out there, you can get it done relatively cheaply. Yeah, I was thinking more of uh, public places and perhaps having um, black cameras, dummy mm. cameras, which uh, would be... You think of a deterrent? Or the, yeah, else. a deterrent in certain public places. Mm. I'm, I'm never sure whether they do act as a deterrent or not. Well, no, nobody's sure whether the speed cameras are at film in the world. Nevertheless, I think most people slow down just in case. <laughs> <laughs> just on, the, on, on that cost, this is a system I've got an I've got two different systems on my house. It shows on the monitor, this is £100 on Amazon. That's a live feed to my camera now in my back garden. So now I've got a speaker, so I can listen to everything that's going on. And then talk more. So if somebody's in the garden, you can actually talk through it on there, and you'll be in my garden to speak to But would you know? How would you know? It means you're alert. It would tell you the answer. My iPhone pings. And it's just like, that's my garden speed has to be back now. It's only about. It sends you an alert on your phone. So you've got to be text sandwiches. No, it's it's simply because everything's on a barcode now. You can, you buy the box, you put your camera in, you press the button, it photographs the barcode, it downloads all the information, and it works. It's cheap, cheerful, and it works. So as long as your phone is on and not switched off when you go to bed, you will get an alert. I don't have a question here. The PC is so sure they your job, they come off to look at the gallery and they can look at safety measures and advice you on. If you had that in our area, so I guess. The PC is so you please give me the support officer. Simon is the one that covers the hail and, and, um, and Bowden. And they will come out and speak to that to them for you. If you've got a, a group from a WhatsApp group or a, a neighbourhood group that wouldn't come do the talk, you'll come quite often come <coughs> do that talking for you. Um, so the, the advice we can get out there for you. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, we've got on uh, besafefeelsafe.co.uk, if you look at the security blog, the first blog that's there, it's got the list of all the PCSOs for our areas, so if you want to have a look at it. In fact, actually, there's a lot of security-related information over there, um, so feel free to have a look. Sorry, yes? Just obviously, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, it's about the, um, what to do if there was an intruder in your house. Mm. Um, and your, uh, um, you said, if you call the police, would the police be able to come out Sort of something like that, or I've heard that in the past that maybe the police, unless there was a violent violence, they wouldn't necessarily come out. No, if, um, if there's somebody in your garden uh, and you call us, that comes with what we call a thieves' office, so somebody trying to break into your house. Yeah. And we've got grading schemes on, on what length of time you've got to get to an incident. And that would be a grade one, which means we've got to get there within 10 minutes. Now, I can tell you, when we get a thieves' on, everything gets left. You know, people are in the station preparing prisoner files, if there are other incidents, they will leave those and they will immediately come to your incident. So if you phone us up and say, there's somebody in my back garden, I've got a balance bar on, that's a thieves on, and then it gets dropped and they go to that. Um, so yes. And we will call 999. Indeed, Lord, yeah. Yeah, you dial 999 if there's an immediate threat to you or anybody else's property. Yeah. You dial 999. I know there have been problems with people getting through to the police, certainly on the 101. The reason being we get so many calls, we've only got a finite number of staff, and sometimes on the 101 it gets bogged down. But if you think somebody's property's in danger, somebody's in physical danger, then you dial 999. If you want to get in touch with other means, you can look at our website, and you can, there's a, a web chat where you can have a web conversation, or if it's really slow time, there's a button you can push and you can report things that way. But if you think somebody's about to break into your house, somebody's in your back garden, they shouldn't be there, it's 999. You say 101? Yeah, 101 is the non emergency number. The issue you've got is you've got so many calls coming at you at one time, and if most of those are 999s, then our operators are going to do those first, and then the 101s are slow time, and it can be frustrating. You know, we've had horror stories of people waiting hours on that 101 to get through. That's why they've created a web chat, you can go over our website, or a reported button on the website where you can type in and pass information on there. But if, if you need immediate police response, it's always 999. And uh, sorry, just to 
fun. Yeah. Uh, what can our WhatsApp groups do? What can we do in our WhatsApp groups if there is a new threat? Can we sort of visit on the Could I just make a quick point? Yeah. We've been told with 101 that the more people from a location that contact 101, the more likely there is that somebody will be sent out to monitor and look at this. Is that a good advice? I wouldn't do 101, but if, if you've got issues such as ASP, if we're not aware of it, then it can't be on our radar. If it's, if it's not an emergency, but you've got problems, the more people that report it, the higher on our radar is we become aware of it. You don't need to do 101, you can do it with the slow time reporting by our website. So that's what we're saying. If you've got an issue, Tell us about it. We're not aware of it. We can't do some long-term problem solving around it. But coming back to yourself in relation to that, if on your WhatsApp group that says there's an alarm going off in a certain area, <coughs> there's nothing wrong with very cautiously going and checking it out. You know, and if then there is movement to the back garden, dial 999. Also, if it's your neighbour's uh, alarm that's going off, you turn all your lights on. You know, make some racket in your own garden as you're looking over uh, in relation to that. Does that answer your question? Top of your app? No, well, I'm thinking about that. Stand back and watch as a witness, but do not get in the way of anybody who's committing a crime. You know, when we go there, we've got body on, we've got body one video. You know, we, we've, yeah, we're trained to do with conflict, and you're not, you're really not. So be witnesses, but really don't get in the way of somebody who thinks committing a crime. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I just add on the WhatsApp group as well? If you can register your WhatsApp group with somebody in the neighbourhood watching the coordinator, uh, it's a good thing. Say why oh, the, the experience we had last year was a, a group of people had a WhatsApp and found the lady at Redditch. And uh, they thought it would be proactive. And uh, they had an incident where the tradesman had his tool set went off with the So he's, he's like all of them. So they go out and they put on the WhatsApp group, there's a guy here with a hoodie and it's quarter past 12 at night and wow. So we're all there. That guy just finished work. He was an innocent bystander. Do you know what I mean? So what are we careful of? Is that there's got to be a structure, a council structure, where you've got people who are trained to deal with it. But you've got reaction and always to go, do you know what? We're going to go there. But quite right the advice you're giving, you've got to be so, so careful. Um, we've got WhatsApp group is good. Register it, but always involved with it. I'm talking about physically, I'm talking about just having, you know, I'm sure any trainers will see a group of people go missing and It's not just that, I'm not just about that I mean, I, th I think on that point, uh, we have a street WhatsApp group, and uh, we've actually managed to spoil the burglary. So, um, uh, one of our neighbours, uh, if you want to identify yourself, uh, Ash, she spoke about it in the last meeting, and we played a little clip. Uh, their CCTV, again, motion sensors. Um, it pinged on their phone and they were away, they were at a friend's place and uh, there were two burglars or three maybe two. Um, and then they've gotten inside the house as well. Uh, and he called us and we sent it out on our WhatsApp group. And we did have neighbours switching on their lights. Uh, one of them came out and a collection of a lot of things and the burglars fled without taking anything. It all happened within I think two, three minutes. Uh, the police did come, but it does help if you and it happened at midnight, so it wasn't even that you know it was during the day, so there is a response. But again, coming back to the point, it should be an active WhatsApp group. I mean, if you set it up and nobody still knows each other, that connection isn't there, that worry isn't there for your neighbor. If it's if it's a, a you know, just just. If the weather's nice, when it's nice, you know, meet up, have a barbecue, just just talk to each other. That and keep that WhatsApp group active. It, it does work. My, my only clear on WhatsApp is don't 
don't usually just scare each other. I'm, I'm, what I would, I'm trying to get a pyramid structure. So if you go WhatsApp group, my PCSOs can't be part of every single WhatsApp group because all they've been doing all day is seeing messages. What I'd like is each WhatsApp group to have one person is perhaps part of the PCSO field safe WhatsApp group as a pyramid structure to get information in and out of those WhatsApp groups. What we have found with some large WhatsApp groups is people scaring each other, putting on footage there of offences that haven't occurred anywhere near them. So they'll put footages on from doorbell uh, and other CCTV, people breaking into houses. They haven't happened around here. You know, they've happened elsewhere in the country. You just need to be a little bit responsible. Yes, if something verified has happened on your street and more people about, fine. Just don't don't put stuff on there unless you verify it. Works. <coughs> so all you then do is scare people. Yeah, and, and being scared is what we're afraid of, trying to get away from. This is all about making people feel safe because they know their community and they feel part of the community. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Luke, we've got a few more documented questions, so if you could pass your comment and then we can. Can I take on a different tack? On the very first slide, maybe I misinterpreted, but suggested that three of the police officers were being recruited, which is excellent news. On the same line, or similar to the plan, it said 500 were retiring. Does that actually mean there's a negative 200 blocks? No, what, what they there's, there's, there's two separate things here. Uh, the government has now said they're going to try and get back to 2010 staffing levels. We lost 2,000 police officers since 2010. So at some point, there is going to be money uh, to try and get back up to 8,000 officers. That's separate. At the moment, we are taking on officers and we're you get somebody to retire every year and then you take on somebody every year. At the moment we're slightly increasing the number we've got. So we've increased, I think, by 300 net number of officers. Yeah, so that takes into consideration. It's, it's a net increase of 300, yeah. Thank you. Um, just moving on to the next one. I, uh, this question was from a resident from Hale Bonds. Um, so again, the number of ratings is still high. We can see why, coming from someone in Hale Bonds. Um, they're often around jewellery, scars and designer watches, handbags, uh, which are being targeted. I think John's already uh, you know, alluded to that. Now, has the police identified the nexus and tried to raid possible shops, buyers of these stolen items? Yeah, the, um, where, where stuff goes to is always a tricky one. Um, and we depend very much on intelligence in relation to that. Um, so if anyone ever, ever does have intelligence about where they think stolen gear are, um, go through crime stoppers and report that anonymously. Wherever we get intelligence about handlers, we do act on that. Um, but sadly, that intelligence is, is really open on But when we do react on it, um, all I would say in relation to vehicles, if you've got a tracking device on that vehicle, uh, a VHF one rather than GPS, um, that assists. Uh, very often we find the chop shops because there's a tracker on the vehicle and we follow it to a garage, uh, raid it and find us you know, hundreds of bits of cars in there. So yes, whenever we do find out where they're to go into, we act on that straight away. Take out a handler, it reduces the places that we're going to take them into. But you know, we rely on the intelligence. Okay. Any follow up questions on this from anybody? Can I just ask? And again, that's back to one of our experiences. One, when the burglaries happen, one of the things that we uh, inform people about is uh, victim support. Is there any targets around how the victim support will be potentially the neighbourhood? Because clearly that's a really important part of what you can say. Uh, it, it is. They will have a target, but I don't know what it is. Oh. There, but I can find out. <coughs> that might be quite helpful because our name is still waiting for the victim support to get inside. How long has that been? Uh, two, two weeks. Really? Okay. And you can be there detailed on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Armin. All right, uh, we'll just move to the next question. Um, sorry. Right, okay, so some residents feel that not much police action is taken with them not even attending the burgled houses or making it a tick box exercise. Um, Asian gold jewelry appears to be a major target. Uh, I think this comes from a person who's been actually burgled four times. 
um, and it's, they feel quite ashamed of the fact that they, that they've been burgled that many times and I haven't received any more information about exactly how and what was taken but they did mention Asian gold jewellery and they feel they're being targeted repeatedly because of that. Okay, every time there is a burglary a police officer will attend uh, to investigate that burglary uh, and see if there are any lines of inquiry. A crime scenes investigation uh, officer will also review it to see whether uh, they should attend if there are forensic opportunities. They should really attend every single domestic burglary in relation to that. Every single burglary in Trafford, a PCSO, a Police Community Support Officer, will attend a certain number of addresses around the uh, address that's been burgled to provide crime prevention advice and see if there's any CCTV. Uh, because again, work has been done says so if you do that, you do prevent those repeat victims. It's a little harsh, but the only thing I'll say is, if you've been burgled four times, have they looked at their crime? Their own security in relation to that. It would be lovely if every time somebody had been burgled, I can put a police car outside their house for a month, but we just can't do that. All we can do is look at each offence. Is there a line of inquiry that is forensic, CTTV, or otherwise that we can follow up? If there isn't, we can't make up, we can't make up evidence, and the evidence isn't there. So what we can do about it. What we do do is we have proactive controlling in certain areas. So where we have burglary hotspots, all staff are aware of that. So the staff are work 24-7. When they've got some downtime, they'll put themselves in that area. We've got our proactive units who will patrol that area. And very often they will work with the, the crime interception unit. Um, they will patrol that area. They're very good at identifying stolen cars. And we work with Cheshire Police as well. Um, and we have weeks of action where they all come into one area and they will patrol that area uh, and target criminals. Very often people don't see that because it's late at night, uh, but the, the troubles are in those areas. So we do police them as best we can in those areas, but again, this is where we need the neighbourhood watch and the home security in place to make people's houses as difficult to get into as possible, and the areas where they live as burglar and friendly as possible, if that makes sense. <coughs> One thing that we used to get into the was a, a report every two weeks about what crimes are taking place. Uh, now, I know there's a new IT system and you're working with it. Can you give us a feedback? Because I know our neighbors would love to know what's going on uh, across the patch. Yeah, the we're, we're, we're still having issues in relation to that. It's as straight for us as it is for you. Um, our information is probably about two weeks behind the lag uh, at the moment, and we don't know when that's going to improve. Could the PCOs, at least even if it's two weeks back, because at the moment I've got stuff from October rather than. We, we could do that, but the reason we give out information about the burglar happening is so that people can be aware of something in their area. I question really two week old information what it's going to be to you. I mean, I will, I will get it to you if you really want it, but a crime crap from two weeks ago, um, I question whether that's really of any use to people, but if they want it, I think things like a window broken or a car, you know, whatever, it, it's a reminder for, and it's, it's live information rather than stuff that's being posted. Yeah. It's just useful for us, even if it's a lack of discussion that we can have with our neighbours. Yeah. We, we, are really, we are really struggling with our, our staff. It may jog somebody's memory. It, it, it would, at the moment, I, can't, I simply can't get the information out to you. In relation to burglaries, I've got information because a great deal of work has been done by people to troll uh, certain reports, and it takes a great deal of time. But for every single crime group, it's taken an awful long time to get any follow statistics at the point of view. Uh, it's not great information, not great advice, but that, that's why we just don't have that. Um, Sir John, do you is it all right to start sharing, even if that information is too weak? So what I, what I will do is I'll, sh I'll share the, the burger information and what we, we do tend to put out is, you know, if we've got a certain area where we've had a number of cars broken into, we'll put it out. And one of the things I'd love to be able to do is get this pyramid structure where you've got neighbourhood watch groups that have got a WhatsApp, but then one person in that WhatsApp group is part of the safe, feel safe WhatsApp group. So we can then just give you the information and it gets cascaded down. At the moment, there are so many WhatsApp groups out there that we just don't know about, 
we can't give it to you. We put it out on our social media, we know that's like Facebook, blah, 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 three inches later it's disappeared and people can't see it. So that's where we need this pyramid structure to do at the top. We give that information, it gets cascaded out, and that would make life so much easier in relation to that. And, and I'll just make a quick point, and um, this isn't really about crime per se, but Trafford Council does have something called Data Lab which does have sophisticated da data across Trafford and can give you visualisations of, of changes and patterns um, about economics, about crime, about the area you live in. So um, do go on to Data Lab if you ever wanted to know more about your area and, and kind of some of the data that's, and patterns that are going on in your area, which might be useful to your neighbourhood watch group. Um, it charts levels of crime. Um, can tell you about the ethnicity of your area and, and useful information like that. So, um, yeah, I, I use it quite a lot. That's helpful. Um, any follow up questions on this? Right, okay. Right. Okay, so now this, the next one's again from Hale Barnes. This time we've had a lot of activity from Hale Barnes. Um, a resident who lives, uh, I think it's a D point road, but it hits on Rosemill or Rossmill, sorry, Lane, um, and uh, he or she, I, I, I don't remember, but it said it's a fairly quiet lane. It's not well lit, and it's easy to get unnoticed. It would be helpful to have more street lighting and possibly CCTV cameras as a deterrent. Yeah, that's the one I think we've, we've discussed that a little bit. Where we can, we will work with council. The street lights down there are. The bulbs are quite dim, um, so we put brighter the lights in there. Uh, so the lights we've got are more effective, and that might be one of those where we, we we pick it off a couple of streets by a couple of streets. Work with the residents. Can the residents put lighting up that lights up the street the edge of their property to do that? Because I, I just can't see the council will have the money anytime soon to, to put more lamp posts in unless you have a different council. Yeah, I, I saw this question. Um, if the person who asked this question wants to come to me at the end. Please do, and I'm more than happy to um, try and tackle this. It is a case of it is a very part, dependent on which side of Rossmill we're talking, uh, the plane we're talking about, but there is a side of it which is very, very rural. Happy to, 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 um, I don't care to try to help, but as Dan has um, alluded to before, just asking as a council, there's not so many you get, um, and, um, but I'm more than happy to, to work and try to try to try to look at that. Um, but the person who asked that question, because it is a very large road, I mean, there are not many houses on it. Um, what's going to be the end up? We really appreciate that. And, and we've got the same problem in Altrincham. I don't know if any of you know the Narrows, um, but it's a, a lovely, beautiful Victorian lane. Um, it takes children from Altrincham Girls' School back into Altrincham Town Centre, and the lighting is, is shocking on there. And we've been trying for years to get new lighting in there, but it does cost a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And the council have got really squeezed capital programs, um, so their budgets are shrinking, and they've, you know, they've got less money, and they're trying to do more. So it, it, it is tricky. But do get hold of your councillors because we will kind of lobby and, and fight for things if we can. Okay. Um, another question from Jane anybody else has any street lighting issues or anything, uh, but you do know you can approach the councillors. Good luck with that though. Um, oh, the funding is an issue, what can you do? Um, right, I think this is just a generic question. Um, I, just, I, oh, just I just thought to give an idea. Um, our street is, is not that bad in lightning, but we put one sensor light ourselves that every time there is movement of a car, it lights up mostly our garden, but it goes to the street a little bit, not too much because apparently then it disturbs drivers. But I've noticed that no cars park anymore, you know, because we had a, our attempted burglar, they, they park right in front of our street. So, and, and I know, and I cut all my trees at the front, I can see everything when that light goes on. So I can see if a person is hiding on the bushes or any car that is parked there, I can see it. That's a great example of crime prevention. So exactly, the, so I think those are little, and really we did ours, it didn't cost that much. Another thing we have, um, don't know if I can say the name, but we have a nest coming at the door. I've noticed nobody offers anything anymore. Even the postman just puts it and goes. 
no one has approached since the door. And uh, yeah, we just did it all ourselves. And another thing we do, it might be a bit too paranoid, but we close all the doors downstairs when we go to sleep or when we go out. So if they get in, they will have a hard time getting to one room to another. And uh, yeah, my kids are also scared. So they have the keys on their rooms, on the indoor. So if anyone gets in the house, they will lock themselves. Little things like this that I think makes us feel a bit more in control. So if it helps. Yeah, an alarm, our alarm, we put alarm downstairs when we go to sleep as well. And it has gone off a few times. So I think they do try, like they knock on windows and things to see if someone is at home or alert or if the alarm is on. You've not been burgled, have you? I've been burgled four years ago. And then we had an attempted burger last uh, August at six in the morning where we are all inside. So yeah, that's when we got very scared. Uh, thanks for that. Um, okay, so I think if anyone has any other street lighting issues, uh, please do raise it, uh, either if you want to through us, um, and I'll put our details at the end, it's there, admin at besafefeelsafe.co.uk, and we can collate it and send it onwards, um, or of course, approach your councillors directly. Uh, <coughs> The next one is um, Hale Village, again, um, the biker issues. I think uh, there's still a few more incidents that happened and uh, people are just feeling vulnerable going into the village. Someone said they're scared to go in and they feel that they could be easily targeted if they're driving a nice car or wearing any sort of jewelry or watches. So just to follow up on that, has that issue stopped? Have the people been identified? Has anything happened with the biker issue? The biker issue in Hale is uh, the issue there is that they're travelling through. So they're not from the community. So identifying who they are um, is proving a little troublesome. Um, sometimes we've got a mistake and people mess about the bikes from CCTV. For other people, you can identify who those bikes belong to. Once you, once you know who the bike belongs to, um, you can see they haven't got insurance, you can see the bike off them. Um, if they have and it's been written in an antisocial manner, you can give them a warning. A uh, piece of legislation that says if you continue to do that, you'll seize your bike. The issue with hail is, I think, is they are having ride outs on Saturdays and Sundays and they're using hail as a method of getting out to Cheshire. And what we're doing is we're trying to <coughs> CCTV in the borough to try and work backwards to see where they are coming from, which estates, identify which houses they're in. And then we can give them these warnings and start seizing bikes. The problem you've got with people riding motorbikes is when they're there and then, is how do you stop it? Um, because if you, you, know, you put a police car in front of the bike and somebody hits it and gets killed or hurt, the police officer driving that vehicle is going to get prosecuted uh, and we will get sued. So when they're actually riding out there and about, it's, it's difficult to stop. You've got to identify them and seize bikes off them at a later time. Uh, I think we've only got two off-road bikes in the force now that we can use to combat these people when they're out about the field. So it's all about, again, letting us know when it's happening. If you can get good descriptions, good photographs on your phone, and you from CCTV, that then allows us to identify these bikes, where they are, and see the bikes at a later date. So what we need to do in relation to that. In relation to the feeling that you're going to get robbed down in Hale Village, we did have that space of robberies where well and twats were taken. Those offenders have now been identified, arrested, and are waiting for uh, sentences. You can't live your life in fear, you've just got to get on with your life while taking sensible and secure precautions. One, one thing I would say is um, the Green Party believes that quad bikes and off road bikes should not be driven on the road in this country. Because of our licensing system, they're allowed to. If they've got an MOT and a B1 license, they're allowed to drive on our roads. Um, so that I think that's something that should change nationally. But also, as the policeman said here, once they start to damage private property, as it be parks, uh, driving off-road and damaging your local area, then it does become a crime. And that's when you really start need to get onto your councillors and start reporting it. And the Green Party actually led on this in Solihull. And they did some uh, transformatory things, really. They've got three full-time police officers now working across Birmingham 
but solely dealing with this issue. Police started to use a helicopter to track the bikes, so they started tracking the bikes around the area, and they knew exactly where they were, and then they were able to set up stingers to puncture the tyres and disable them. And with the intelligent gathering operation, it, it became easier to re report it as well. And then the bikes were seized and crushed um, in, in many cases. But um, this, this is a, a growing problem. I, I think that the licensing rule, you know, the MOT rules, licensing rules really need to be tightened by the government and we, we should you know, lobby your MP for that because the, the, these bikes, especially quad bikes and off-road bikes, shouldn't be on our roads in my opinion. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, that's helpful. I think then perhaps uh, a meal to Graham Brady is uh, on the chart. So we'll do that. Um, any further questions on this from anybody? No, okay. So uh, we'll just move on. Um, so somebody has asked for more speed. Uh, we need speed, speed breakers and CCTVs on all roads connecting all to you to Wittenshaw. I think that's been raised a few times because, especially across that Grove Lane and that whole bit, um, what's being done about it? Okay, well, I've discussed that. We're looking for funding for ANPR cameras, they're the ones we call the plates, and the CCTV project, we love to get CCTV cameras down there. There are probably about five, six different routes you can go from Hale through to within shore, um, and a good proportion of our workers are probably coming from there. That's what we need to do around the CCTV council system project and see if we can get funding. About 25,000 pounds from ANPR cameras for those, those lanes. Is it in process or is it something that needs to be initiated? Um, I'm, I'm just looking to see whether we can get funding. Uh, I've already spoken to our ANPR team. If there is funding there to buy the cameras, we can buy them and then gift them to the ANPR team and they will be put on the link where we want them to be. So it's, it's I did speak earlier about active neighbourhoods and the money that's available from uh, central Manchester grants for, for councils to redesign roads. And cars are allowed to speed around our neighbourhoods way too fast. And in, in Altrincham, you'll get cars going down side streets at 50 miles an hour quite regularly. And these are areas where there's local schools. And we need to change that. And now we've got the chance for communities to come together and start to redesign their roads, access funding for it, and rebalance it from cars back to people, back to cycling and walking, and creating these, these routes. And people are doing it now. Hermston has already developed a scheme. And later on in January, they've got a, a, an open discussion where people can come along and contribute. But this is a great chance now, really exciting chance for Manchester to develop uh, roads are a lot safer, more about people, uh, more about communities, and, and stopping cars from being allowed to speed around at uh, you know, the these, these, these speeds that they're doing and endangering lives. Yeah, uh, any follow up questions? Right, okay. Uh, so I'm going on to the next one. Um, so somebody uh, sent a link of um, about £153 million being invested by the council in purchasing some properties. Um, I did read it, but I've forgotten which ones it is. So you have it, okay, good. Uh, now, the question really was that if they've got that much money, why can't they invest similar budgets on emergency services? And then the second one was, what benefits can residents expect from these recent purchases, especially around revenue earned being allocated towards better safety arrangements being made? Yeah, that's a really good question. And we've already mentioned that council budgets have been squeezed by 60% by central government. So what central government have done, they've allowed councils to take cheap loans from central government. So lowering at very low interest rates and what councils are being um, encouraged to do more and more across the country is to invest that, those, these loans into property. The property is meant to be generally for regeneration, um, but the councils are investing to give them a small budget stream back by which they can put into your services. So if the councils weren't able to do this, they wouldn't be able to keep, keep the budgets that they are. 
Um, so the Green Party obviously is against this, but it's something that the national central government is encouraging. So more and more, you'll be seeing councils investing in properties around the UK. Um, so, for instance, Trafford has got property in Preston. As you've seen, it's got property in central Manchester, and it's, it's developing a property uh, portfolio. Some of that is for regeneration, um, but um, such as uh, it's, it's bought Rackham's, for instance, which it will be uh, turning into affordable housing. But this is a very worrying trend, and it is our money. And any type of investment, even though it's done prudently, and the, the council are trying to do it as prudently as possible, it's still a risk, and it's your money. Um, and it, much of it is to do with the cuts that are coming from central government. So councils are getting a small budget stream from it, and it is helping their budgets to some degree, but you know that's the current situation. And we have seen some councils across the country go bankrupt or be on the verge of bankruptcy such as North Hampshire. I think we can still ask, isn't it? Because this 153 has been spent. Yes. So it's been spent. We can't do anything about it. But what can we, as a community, get back from it? Well, the, it's an investment. So that investment is bringing us a return, return, and that return goes into the council's And then they can reallocate it yes, to safety projects. Yes, they are projects. Because the council the funds have been cut so much that using these investments to create money to come back into their services. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit complicated to understand, and it is wrapped up in a lot of legal aid. Mm -hmm. That's what councils are doing with the council. They're investing in a portfolio to bring the return of the health and services that are being done. So I think, again, I think if uh, you know, that money is coming back, even if a little bit back to the council, if we as residents raise our concerns, then some of it could be allocated back to us. Um, okay, any, any follow-up questions on this point? Okay. Um, I think uh, Amr has already asked about the bi-weekly crime uh, stats, and hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get something, even if it is a bit old, and restarting again. I think, and there was the last one which I picked up, uh, which came through a little late, it was around Chapel Lane and the same issue as Ross Mill, uh, Chapel Lane being used by bikers and, uh, you know, um, marking properties almost uh, for other criminal activities to happen. Uh, so again, Chapel Lane is another weak spot. So. Was it a route to from Withenshaw? Uh, not a route from Withenshaw, I can read out exactly what was asked, but uh, it's it's around uh, Chapel Lane being used by uh, bikers, and uh, one of the residents noticed that uh, they were marking properties, leaving some bits on bushes um, on certain properties. Um, now, uh, uh, the thing is that I think it was around uh, wanting to keep that area safer. Can you can you pass me their details? I will do. Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to send some um, the floor is open for any last questions. We are out of time, but if there are any burning questions, please do ask now. Right, okay. Um, so we're wrapping up for today. Thank you so much to everybody uh, who's taken the time out to attend. I hope you have had um, some questions of yours which you may have had answered. Um, the panel will be around for, I think, five minutes. Yeah, all right, because we do have to wrap up and close. Uh, but feel free to talk to them. And thank you so much for attending. We'll have all the information out on our website. But if you all have registered and you've given your emails, then we'll also send out the meeting minutes on email. We don't put meeting minutes up on the website uh, just because there's a lot of content uh, and sometimes names associated. So we only send it out through email. Uh, thank you everyone and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Uh, sorry, and uh, I keep forgetting, I really need to thank uh, the admins of Be Safe, Being Safe, um, and also our volunteers. Uh, so if I can do that, because I always tend to forget. Uh, so I'd like to thank our speakers for today.
Thank you, um, Inspector oh, John, um, Tony Moran for coming here, Councillors Dan Jerome and David Morgan, um, Dr. Armin Hanan and Gary, and also the admin, uh, Dr. Shinar Savan, um, Ash Fadim, I don't know your names, I don't know if you can look there. <laughs> Uh, and we don't have uh, Caroline and Eleanor here, and then we've got uh, Nigel. So thank you to all the organisers. Thank you to yourself for coming here. And please help yourself to teas and coffees. And uh, lastly, I'll leave the slide for any information you want in terms of connecting with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, for the coffees. Thank you. <laughs>